Continuing on our quest to detail and explain the subtle and not so subtle differences between all of the metallic dragons has been a very fun experience because from the outside they all look the same, but once you take a closer look, they all have very unique and flavored features that makes each of them pop in their own special way. Today we shall talk about the life of the party, the prankster dragon, or as you would know it, the copper dragon. The Copper Dragons are known to be storytellers, pranksters, jokers, and riddlers. They are extremely social dragons who thrive to amuse, to misguide, to subvert, to frustrate, but most of all, to entertain and be entertained. They live in hills and rocky terrains. Now, when it comes to physical appearance of the Copper Dragon, you really ought to pay attention this time because Copper Dragon territories tend to overlap big time with many other dragons, but specifically with Red Dragons. Now, red dragons and copper dragons can look shockingly similar to a stray observer, and the difference between them in terms of social interactions could not be more different. To keep it simple, a red dragon will eat you and your children, while a copper dragon will invite you over for dinner and make you laugh. So, telling them apart is kind of crucial. Both dragons can be found in the same environments, their colors are very similar, and their horns could be potentially mistaken by an adventurer, so a close hit here. The real tail here are the wings. The manta ray shaped wings of the copper dragon will undoubtedly help you differentiate it from red dragons and that really will be the only clue that you will ever get. Brass dragons can also be found in close proximities to copper dragons and those can be even harder to differentiate since they have the same style of wings. The big difference here though is that copper dragons have very long and curved alar limbs which create this sort of U-shaped wing situation so if you were to see them flying you would be able to tell them apart if you pay close attention that way. Otherwise, their facial structure can be differentiated by the fact that brass dragons have no horns, whereas copper dragons do. Now, social and combat interactions between the copper dragons and other types of dragons in their environments are actually fairly interesting, which is, of course, not something that the 5th edition Monster Manual covers. But hey, that's what we're here for. In order to break down all of their secrets, let's first see what the actual Monster Manual tells us, and then take it from there. The manual tells us about their social personality and their pranking nature, of course. They're basically everything that we have already covered. They tell us that they're willing to carve out sections of their lair in order to host bards and possibly other storytellers just for the purpose of conversation. And they tell us that they like medals for treasure and that they're wary of showing off their hoard to people. You know, very simple, basic information about this very specific type of dragon. So now let's talk about what they actually don't tell you. Let's start where we left off, social interactions between dragons. See, the monster manual does not tell you that even though copper dragons love to socialize and entertain all manner of intelligent creatures, they actually avoid as much as they can interacting with other dragons. That is because copper dragons really do enjoy being the life of the party. They, they love the spotlight and showing off how witty they are, but, but they get incredibly annoyed when they get bested or when someone else takes on that spotlight. Seldom any creature can actually do that other than, well, other copper dragons. When a copper dragon meets another, they banter with each other, sometimes for hours, but some other times for days. They do their best to one-up each other during the banter, becoming more and more outrageous and personal every single time they try to outdo each other. Now, this goes on and on and on until eventually one of the dragons ends up offended by one of the jokes, vows for revenge, and then storms off. Now, this never turns violent and the actual anger doesn't really last for long, but the rivalry this creates does last long, in fact, for centuries. The two dragons typically become rivals for hundreds of years, playing practical jokes on one another and pranking each other without end, which is, of course, quite inconvenient for the two of them over time. Now, copper dragons know that dealing with each other typically results in this ending, and as such, they try to avoid each other as much as they can unless they want a rival for life. Now, something similar actually happens when a copper dragon meets the very sociable brass dragon, where the conversation lasts for hours and hours until it eventually ends with either the copper dragon getting bored because the brass dragon is not saying anything witty back, or because the brass dragon gets offended at some outrageous personal joke coming from the copper dragon. These interactions typically end there, and one of the two typically just storms off abruptly after hours of conversation. 
Now, Copper Dragon mating rituals are actually quite adorable because, as, as cheesy as it sounds, they look for a mate that can make them laugh. They use their wit to cleverly complement their date. They use their skill for pranks to create adorable surprises for each other. And instead of getting offended by outrageous personal jokes, they become enthralled with each other's ability to, well, like I said before, make each other laugh. These relationships, for as intense as they are, they actually don't last very long. After the mating is done and the children are raised, the dragons will almost always separate. Copper dragons being free spirits forces them to want to seek new adventures and new people to joke around with. Now, for obvious reasons, copper dragons also avoid red and blue dragons who also tend to overlap with their territories as well. But if forced into a confrontation with them, the copper dragon will try their best to embarrass them and frustrate them. How? Well, let's talk about some of the cool combat abilities that Copper Dragons have. See, the Monster Manual completely neglects to talk about one of the coolest features of the Copper Dragon, which is their amazing ability to control the Earth. See, all dragons are natural sorcerers. Typically, they all have the ability to cast a limited amount of spells that sort of relate to their color and environment. I mean, they are extraordinarily magical creatures, we know that. Copper dragons, specifically, can mold the earth at their will. They can create enormous pillars of stone, turn the ground into mud, and move rock from one place to another. See, the Monster Manual very specifically mentions that they like to carve out places within their lair for bards, but they sort of miss talking about how they can do that. In fact, they love building and moving the rock around inside of their lair, specifically to create very complex labyrinths and then fill them with trash. Perhaps. The Earth is everything to these dragons, to the point where they actually enjoy making their layers super compact and snug, even to the point where it actually prevents them from flying inside of their lair. Why? Because the dragon doesn't actually need to fly, in fact doesn't really like to fly as much. It instead jumps from one place to another and climbs a lot. The copper dragon is virtually the only dragon who would specifically make its lair as snug as possible. In fact, it is described that the copper dragon have overdeveloped massive shoulders and thighs, because basically all they do is jump and climb. Here, let me quote you the combat style of the copper dragon as described to us by the second edition Monstrous Manual. Quote, Copper dragons like to taunt and annoy their opponents, hoping they will give up or become angry and act foolishly. Early in the encounter, a copper dragon will jump from one side of an opponent to another, landing on inaccessible or vertical stone surfaces. If there are no such places around a dragon's lair, the dragon will create them ahead of time using its stone shape, move earth and wall of stone. An angry copper dragon will mire its opponents using rock to mud and will force its victims who escape the mud into it with kicks. When fighting airborne opponents, a dragon will draw its enemies into narrow stone gorges where it can use its spider climb ability in an attempt to maneuver the enemy into colliding with the walls." End quote. This is what fighting a copper dragon is like. They lead you around from place to place, force you into a place where you cannot run around, and then slam you with rock spells. And they do all of this without even flying. How epic is that? It's interesting because this is what they would have to do if they would want to have any chance whatsoever of ever defeating a red dragon since, well, red dragons are virtually the strongest dragon in the world, at least in terms of pure might, and they tend to live on the same ecosystems. So they have to be creative in that regard and, and prevent said dragon from flying if they were to fight each other. A red dragon attacking a copper dragon slayer would be at a severe disadvantage because of that. You can probably already see that copper dragons are actually quite smart, or at least they use their wit in many fronts. They're quite good hunters because of this, especially when it comes to food. See, copper dragons can eat virtually anything, but hunting their meals is as much a part of the meal as the actual eating. They hate it when the meal that they're hunting does not fight back. Because of that, they're particularly fond of hunting dangerous poisonous monsters, specifically the giant monstrous scorpion, which is the their favorite food. The Monster Manual doesn't actually tell you, but copper dragons are in fact immune to poison and venom when it is ingested. To the dragon, venom is tasty and spicy which enriches their meals, and their digestive tract is designed in such a manner that it'll actually protect them against this sort of poison damage. They are, however, still vulnerable to poison injections, like the sting attack of a scorpion or the fangs of a giant viper. 
Most, if not all, Copper Dragons, though, gain the Sorcerer's ability to cure poison, though, so it's not as much of a problem for them. But regardless, fighting these monsters provides a fun challenge for the dragon while hunting. Now, what's interesting though is that copper dragons who live close or in humanoid society do end up acclimating and adapting to humanoid food. In fact, it is well known by those who know of copper dragons living in a city that they tend to fall addicted specifically to wine. Copper dragons love wine, though their immunity to ingested poison would prevent them from actually getting drunk. Do keep in mind though that rarely do copper dragons get the ability to polymorph into humans. In the monster manual, only ancient copper dragons have the ability, but even still, not 100% of ancient copper dragons would even get it. Copper dragons crave society and interaction with humanoids, so they find themselves all the time being forced to make deals with towns or cities as protectors in exchange for being allowed to have property around the city. If the dragon had the ability to polymorph into a human, then of course he wouldn't have to do that, like I said before, he would just live with the humans. But that ability seems to be fairly rare amongst this particular kind of dragon. What happens sometimes though, and this is especially true for copper dragons who live close to humanoid societies, is that these dragons can turn evil. See, the monster manual mentions that copper dragons are very careful with their hordes, especially around guests. What they don't actually tell you is that copper dragons are actually the greediest out of all of the metallic dragons. Their avarice peaks to the point of challenging even those of the chromatic variety. Quote, so taken are they with their own charm that they cannot help but believe that they deserve to have whatever they want." End quote. See, these dragons are the rogue or, or the scoundrels of the dragon kind. You can find some really nice charming ones, you know, witty and fun to be around, and then you can have some of them who will steal and misdirect others just that they can have the treasure. In fact, Gary Gygax himself described these dragons as extremely selfish. What they do is they use their wit and charm to guile fools into giving them treasure, or they use their wit to form legit or illicit businesses with the purpose of obtaining large wealth. In fact, many a thieves guild are actually run by copper dragons around cities. They don't kill people, of course, but they have no qualms about stealing or taking money from them as long as they felt like they have outsmarted their competition. At least there is some honor among these thieves. I would like to personally thank my Patreon supporters Rukato Fan, Major Fail Gaming, Wyatt Curling, Toby Oliver, Dylan Baker, Zach Bowell, Casey Butler, and Mediogre at Best for supporting me on Patreon at the $25 level. If you would like to support me as well, then please head on over to patreon.com slash Rex to support. Thank you guys so much for watching. Make sure to watch the other dragon videos that we've been making for the last couple of months. They are amazing. I'm having a blast creating them. And we still have a lot of dragons to go through. So stay hyped, guys, because this has been really, really fun. See you all on the next video. Bye-bye.